Have you heard the one about the frog in the boiling water? Put a frog in a pot of boiling water and it will leap out. But put it in cool water and slowly heat it up and it'll boil to death. That's not literally accurate. The frog would definitely try to escape in either case. But metaphorically, this scenario is playing out in all of our cities, just over years and decades, not minutes. You may be thinking, but cheddar, isn't the whole world getting hotter? And yeah, you're right. But of all the Earth's surface, cities are getting the hottest. And for the vast majority of us who live in cities, this spells danger because extreme heat is the deadliest of all weather hazards. Even our one respite from the heat, cool nights, is disappearing in urban areas. And unlike the frog, we can't leap out. There are clever solutions to cool our cities, which could work if we move quickly. Otherwise, barring rapid expansion of these guys' new hobby, we're stuck here. There's nowhere to go. Images like these are really shocking. But in terms of overall deadliness, extreme heat beats them all. Turning now to a dangerous and unprecedented heat wave. The death toll estimated at nearly 200. Homeless people among the hardest hit. The exact mechanisms of heat deaths are complex, but they boil down to two types. The first is heat stroke, which is directly attributable to heat. In short, the body can no longer cool itself down, which can trigger central nervous system dysfunction or even multiple organ failure. There's also a phenomenon called wet bulb deaths, which is where a combination of heat and humidity makes it so that sweat can no longer evaporate. We need to keep our temperature in this narrow range, right? We're not, we're not reptiles. So the way we do it is through sweating. But if there's too much moisture in the air, I can't effectively sweat. The second type of heat fatalities are called excess deaths. So excess deaths are people who uh, die due to pre-existing conditions that are exacerbated by heat. Often, those won't be listed as heat-related deaths, but, but the extreme heat loaded the dice, turned up the risk. Ironically, it's the increasing heat after the sun goes down that could be the most dangerous. At night, dense materials release the heat they absorbed during the day, which is causing a dramatic increase in nighttime temperatures and stifling our chance to cool down. And it's the nighttime lows that don't get below 86 degrees, which is kind of the average skin temperature of humans, so the body can't have a chance to cool back down. So why does this happen in cities? Three words, urban heat islands. The concept of urban heat islands is very simple. Things that are more dense uh, take longer to heat up and then longer to release that heat back into the environment. And so bricks, uh, concrete, steel are all very dense materials. Whereas in a forest or a meadow where there's a lot of surface and a lot of moisture on those surfaces, a lot of the sun's energy, instead of directly warming things up, will be evaporating some of that water, um, which is a process that doesn't create as much heat. To put it very simply, the sun's energy has roughly three options when it reaches Earth. One, become an ingredient for plant photosynthesis. Two, evaporate nearby water. Neither of those cause much of a temperature rise and can even cool down an area by providing shade or putting water into the air. The trouble comes with option three, heat up whatever other materials are around. And in cities, especially dense ones like New York, there are a lot of other materials. Just look at these maps. See the near-perfect overlap of vegetation and cooler temperatures? This also highlights the disparities between neighborhoods. Note how the coolest neighborhoods with the most vegetation are also the wealthiest. So even though greenhouse gases heat the world roughly equally, cities, and especially poorer neighborhoods, are often hotter than suburban or rural areas by up to 15 to 20 degrees. There might be the same amount of warming in the city as the surrounding areas, but because the city's starting from a higher baseline, there's more risk. 
This is already evident in New York, which was recently reclassified from a humid continental climate to humid subtropical. The number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit will triple um, towards the end, end of the century. And so, um, you know, New York City is going to start feeling more like Birmingham, Alabama. Speaking of Alabama, their state flower, the camellia, is now successfully growing in New York. We've known about UHI for a long time, as far back as the early 1800s, when amateur meteorologist Luke Howard began comparing temperatures in London to the countryside. But we put the matter on the back burner for nearly two centuries. It hasn't been until about the 1990s when climate change was really being brought into the conversation that we started looking at the urban heat island effect. But now, the situation seems to be coming to a boiling point. Since it's unlikely that everyone will move elsewhere, cities need ways to turn down the heat. Fortunately, there are many solutions. First, trees. Trees that can provide shade, and they can evapotranspire moisture into the atmosphere, which also produces the, the heating. Unfortunately, the U.S. is losing trees at an alarming rate, about 36 million per year. This is why the first part of New York's plan was planting 1 million trees between 2007 and 2017. The second solution takes place well above the trees, on rooftops. So cool roofs are essentially a white or refractive surface on a roof, and so it doesn't absorb as much energy. But when you cluster these cool roofs in close geographic proximity, you can actually start seeing a reduction in neighborhood temperatures and ambient temperatures. So we've already coated 10 million square feet of rooftops across the city, and our goal is to continue to, to coat 1 million square feet each year. In addition to reflective paint, building owners can reduce heat by installing rooftop gardens or solar panels. There are a few other strategies like opening cooling centers, prioritizing lighter construction materials, and deploying tens of thousands of air conditioners to vulnerable people, which is what New York did to protect low-income residents during last summer's stay-at-home orders. Ultimately, though, there's only one way out of this. You know what's coming. It's a climate change video. We have to talk about it. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So I do have confidence that we could quickly bend the curve towards reducing far less emissions. But I have to be honest and say that I'm not like totally optimistic. But unfortunately, how quickly climate change is happening, how quickly we're seeing extreme long lasting heat waves. Um, there, I think it's very hard to be optimistic because it looks to me like things are happening a lot faster than our climate models predicted. So what do you think? Has this video convinced you to start looking at properties in, say, my home state of Nebraska? Let us know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe so you catch future videos.